Welcome to Building Tomorrow, a podcast about how tech and innovation are changing the modern world for the better, or at least can change the world for the better. With me in the studio are Matthew Feeney, Cato's Director for Emerging Technology, and Peter Van Doren, editor of the Regulation Journal. Today, we're going to talk about a method of voting that is relatively new to the U.S. at least, called ranked choice voting, which could transform American politics in significant ways. But first, you might be thinking, okay, you said tech and innovation. How is voting a technology? I'm glad you've asked. We here at Building Tomorrow have an expansive definition of what counts as tech. Uh, I think sometimes folks have a something of a vulgar understanding of tech as like new material things, uh, like a cell phone or one of those as seen on TV kitchen gadgets that you use once and then never again. But the simplest definition of tech is as a recipe of knowledge. Any new combination of inputs and process to create a product is a tech. For example, when primitive man discovered rubbing sticks together and the friction could make fire, that was technology. When factory owners discovered the gains in efficiency from assembly lines versus do-it-all-yourself craftsmanship, that was technology. And so too is a new way of voting. Voters make inputs. The vote is an input. A new process for apportioning or counting those votes is devised. And the product, in theory, is an improved means of selecting representatives. So voting is a tech. We're in our wheelhouse. But let's kick things off with something kind of basic. Let's start with what is wrong with how we currently vote, how we currently do things in the U.S. Um, maybe, Matthew, can, you can launch us here. When we talk about how we currently do things in the U.S. when it comes to voting, most elections are what we call first-past-the-post voting. What is that? Maybe you can tease some of the, the problems with that for us. Yeah, first-past-the-post is, uh, put simply, whoever wins the most votes in a given constituency wins. He's, and uh, it's the, the form of voting that uh, Americans are the most familiar with. Uh, it's used the most. Uh, and it's very simple. So in a constituency, whether it's a, a congressional district or a state assembly district, uh, voters show up to the polling booth and they cast their vote. And whoever gets the most votes uh, within that uh, area is elected. Uh, we're very used to it, uh, but it's not the only uh, voting system out there. And there are a couple of issues associated with it, uh, namely that it encourages people to vote for the lesser of two evils, uh, for people to uh, perhaps not vote their conscience. And part of what I hope to get to in uh, in this podcast is, well, uh, how do we know a good voting system when we see one? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. if, if we have a view of voting systems as being good if they accurately reflect, reflect the preferences of the voters and voters have an incentive to vote their conscience, then uh, first past the post as practiced in the state seems to fail. Uh, but it's uh, certainly not the only system out there. Well, and there's, um, I, I should note for our listeners as well that it, it, you, you, and we, we are familiar with this because we see it in elections quite frequently. When we say the person who gets the most votes, just to be clear, we don't even mean a majority of votes, right? right? It doesn't have to be 50 plus one. It's it's typically a plurality. Right. So mm -hmm. you, this is why you have a situation – you can have a situation like in the most recent presidential election in 2016 or the election in 2000 um, where someone who got actually a minority of the votes, you know, 48, 49 percent um, or less can actually win against someone who had more votes, mm -hmm. you know, in neither case – does the candidate – does one candidate have a majority of votes? Now, they get somewhat complicated because of the electoral college and that's a whole nother conversation. But we – is quite routine that in the US we have representatives who are selected by a plurality of voters and not a majority. Um, that's that's become ordinary uh, I think. And when, when we talk about some of the, the flaws here, you mentioned uh, people not feeling free to vote their conscience. Um, and we, that's kind of become commonplace. I mean, the part of the human condition is that we get used to. You do something long enough, it feel it starts to feel normal. You might not like it, but it feels routine and normal. And this is true with, I think, this idea of voting for the lesser of two evils. I mean, very few people were excited to vote for anybody in 2016. I mean, sure there were people who loved, you know, I'm with her. I, or love Donald Trump, you know, make America great again. But all the all, all the data suggests that most people who voted in 2016 
were unenthusiastic about their options. They voted against someone rather than for someone. And a lot of them say kind of a pox on both both their houses when it comes to political parties. Uh, the data I saw was uh, that 68% of Americans say that they're unhappy with the two party choices, major party choices they have and would prefer a third major party mm -hmm. existed. So that's over two thirds of Americans are not happy with the choices they have, which means when they go into the voting booth, they're voting typically for, eh, who do I feel least bad about? I'm less troubled by all of this than all than you This are. doesn't bother you? Why, why no. doesn't it bother you, Peter? Uh, <clears throat> what, well, we need to, to have them, I mean, in voting, um, if there are theories of voting, and so if everyone except the median voter is always unhappy. Um, okay. I yeah. mean, by definition, in in if when you have two choices and there are theorems about if you array people on a ideological spectrum, the left always is unhappy, the right is un always unhappy, and some weird person in the middle who doesn't know very much is the median voter. And okay, that's just the way it is. And um, but you can have uh, people who are unhappy with the. Uh, the people who make up a legislative body uh, while also being happy with the voting system, saying, I wish people voted differently. Well, but you're right. I mean, there, there are many different ways to aggregate preferences right. in, into collective choices, and they have – and they differ. And so then you've already presupposed – you've had a normative discussion in your heads without telling everybody what it is, and thus you've concluded that – one way of aggregating preferences into outcomes is somehow better than some other way of aggregating preferences into outcomes. Given that underlying preferences can be stated and are stable, um, there's a vast literature that tries to work through um, who wins, what kinds of preferences are represented under what kinds of aggregation systems. And so um, I'll give you an example. I mean, there's a literature that says um, in 1972, under any system other than the one we had, Muskie would have won the nomination hmm. on the Democratic side, not McGovern. So the question is, is, would that have been better or worse? Well, it depends on what you want collective choice systems to do. Um, we could talk about conflict resolution. Uh, we could talk about, in other words, there's conflicts in society. So the question is, do you want that represented in the legislature where every Every side has a has somebody in the legislature. Or do you want to, in effect, urge or create incentives for uh, compromise before elections are held by having parties, two parties rather than multi parties? Well, if we so maybe we could take it to a, a very small constituency in a very simple election. So uh, the the neighborhood gr I grew up in, let's say, uh, and all the neighbors were going to vote on. Who, how much everyone should chip in for uh, raking leaves or something like that, right? Uh, if we did a poll before this election and it revealed that 60% of residents would be happy to pay more than they currently are and 40% are less likely and they voted for a body of, of 10 people to decide this issue, uh, would it be a good voting system if six of the people who ended up being elected backed paying more and four of the people less? I think Peter's right to say there is a un- uh, unexamined perhaps assumption here, which is if the legislative body reflects popular opinion, we seem to think that's by definition a good uh, election system, but it's not necessarily the case. Right? Well, it's by definition a more, I mean, a, a, a more, more democratic system. I mean, right, like in the sense of a system that most closely represents the desire of the demos of the people, then the 60% of the people is an accurate is the most accurate reflection it's having six out of ten representatives reflecting 60 percent of the you know the people in the area that's a more democratic way now whether that's preferable to right that's that is a, an assumption we could have lots of policy referenda and no legislature at all right or think of the west think of california i mean they have referenda all the time and the voters get to decide and the literature isn't very positive about that. I mean, the California voters have voted for X and not X. Mm -hmm. 
Right. <laughs> at, yeah. Sometimes yeah. at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So, Cut out the middleman and just vote for it directly. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, be, I guess I'm I'm more ag- I, in other words, even trying to figure out what people's preferences are about public policies. Matt said there's public opinion polls. Well, I'm I've never known economists are suspicious of that because it's never attached to money. Well, and it doesn't. Um, it doesn't. Yeah, do in other words, there's no budget constraint. Right. Uh, it, it doesn't do a good job of expressing intensity of preference either. You might have 60 percent of people who mildly prefer paying more for leaf raking, but the 40 percent really hate it. Therefore, I mean, like, right. And so, if the goal is really assessing the the net mood towards leaf raking. A 60-40 split might not actually f- represent the intensity of preference because it's an up or down vote Correct. versus a system where there's a, another way of apportioning how much your vote counts, which and there's theories for doing that, that we can get into later. But, I mean, to your point. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it also raises this interesting issue of uh, delegates versus representatives, mm-hmm. that uh, we have representatives, not delegates. We, we we vote for people, and then their job is to go to Washington or the state house and exercise their conscience and not constantly be on the phone calling around saying, so what should I do? What do you think? What do, and you, Which is a different kind of job. Uh, Peter's mention of referendum uh, reminded me of uh, as I'm sure listeners are aware, there's this big fuss uh, over the pond in England and the UK about uh, Brexit. Speaking and of the unintended br- consequences. Br- yeah. The British voters are both for and against it at well, the right. same time. This is a, It is very <laughs> odd to hear the reasons why now there are people who are backing what they are, of course, calling a people's vote, which is a second <laughs> referendum. <laughs> and uh, there's a very popular British political show called Question Time, which is weekly, and it's in front of a studio audience, and it takes people from across the political spectrum and usually a, a commentator or cultural you know, icon or something. And what was astonishing in recent weeks is how uh, was people in the audience saying something like, well... We shouldn't have had a referendum because we're not experts. You know, you're we are, and I just <laughs> yeah. thought, well, but why is Brexit different to education or foreign policy or yeah. far? I mean, it's in, it's well, struck me as somewhat bonkers. Do, does the U.S. want a wall or not? Yeah, uh, try to figure. I mean, that's some a people hard thing do, to figure but out, yeah. but if you introduce how much it would cost and it would use it would require the eminent domain to take away lots of private land in Texas. So if you're if you're Tea Party, are you? You're against immigrants, but are are you for private property? In other words, all the complications of actually building a wall. Um, many wall supporters might be for it and against it, depending on the information they were provided. And, depending how you ask the question, basically, right? right. Didn't our uh, resident director of polling, uh, Emily Eakins, recently release a poll about paid family leave hinged to cost, yes, right? I mean, so yeah, which I suppose we should have perhaps more, more polling like that would well, be she's, useful. She's consciously trying to introduce economist notions into public opinion so that being for or against something isn't free, right? The typical public opinion question is um, there's no budget constraint and there's no trade-offs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I, okay, assume a can opener. I mean, it... it right. Uh, so, but, uh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, so... Um, I think you're right, Peter, to point out some Norbin of assumptions going into how how we you know how 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 the question got set up. Um, and I, but rather than coming down on one side that this is the proper set of criteria, I think we can identify here are the implications for good or for ill of how we currently do things, and here are the implications, possible implications of changing that up. And then our listeners can decide whether or not they think those mix of things are beneficial on you're, the net or not. I think you're right? quite correct to point out that elect- electoral systems, when confronted with more than two candidates or two choices at a time, <clears throat> there's possibilities. You talked about the ter- technical terms are sincere versus strategic voting. Do you vote your preferences or are you trying to guess what everyone else is going to do and then vote in a way that enhances what you want, even though it's not what other people want, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there's a whole literature on that. So you're, you're quite, and then you mentioned intensities, which is again, once uh, <clears throat> what some of the schemes we're going to talk about today do is try to get people to rank order possibilities rather than yes, no, and and that <clears throat> introduces the possibility of intensity that you described, and that's 
it, that's useful because in the current and first past the post, we throw away lots of information. Yeah. Whereas if we forced voters to rank order choices, um, then there's still ways of aggregating given that information that differ, but at least we would have all that information to, to make our choices. So maybe something to, to note here, a few more uh, features or flaws, depending on how you look at, of a first past the post system. When you talk about throwing away information, uh, this shows up, one of the ways this shows up is that our system, and we've alluded to this, tends to depress the, the viability of third parties. So the number of parties, essentially you have two major parties, party in power, party in opposition in the US, and then our third parties are the vestigial organs of, of parties rather than viable parties themselves. This is unlike much of the rest of the world where they have functioning multi-party democracies, maybe three or four as in, this is fairly common in Great Britain, maybe more and more, even more parliamentary systems like uh, Germany or, uh, or other countries. But having more than two parties, we are actually somewhat odd and there are other countries where that's true, but we are relatively odd in having only two viable parties. So what what we should expect then is to say in a system that where where voting is done differently and votes are apportioned differently uh what appears to be more normal is that people want more choices than just two like in a sense the default is people prefer more political options in the US we constructed the system which constrains some of those those choices so people who would have voted for a third party instead feel that they need to vote more strategically. They can't waste their vote. I need to vote for a Republican or a Democrat because they're the only people who have the chance of actually winning. And so it, it shoves third parties kind of off to the side in, in, in election contests, which means third parties, um, their main route to significance in the U.S. as opposed to other countries is that they tend to try to spoil elections with the goal of pushing a party in a, one of the major parties in another direction to try to absorb them. It's, it's influenced by subsumption. It would be like the, uh, the Dixiecrats in the mid-20th century. They're unhappy with the National Democratic Party moving to be more in favor of desegregation, more pro-civil rights. And so these racist you know, white Southern Democrats said, we're going to make it harder for the Democratic Party to win by creating this third party, the Dixiecrats, until one of the major parties listens to our concerns and helps us continue to maintain uh, white supremacy in the South, right? And it worked. They eventually got subsumed. It was a multi-decade process. They eventually get subsumed by the Re Republican Party during the 1960s and 70s. So like that that might that particular case we're not saying yay dixiecrats but that is the path that's that's the path to political viability for a third party whatever the content of their beliefs are again i would so the design of electoral systems um do you want conflict resolution to occur prior to elections mm -hmm. or do you want conflict resolution to occur as part of coalition for formation within the legislature after the election so yeah, yeah. think of israel right where the 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 religious the ultra orthodox parties a minority in israel but a very intense minority are represented in the legislature in the knesset if if whereas strong minorities in the united states <clears throat> have to do what you described and there's pressures within parties to sort of accommodate them, but also to say, well, you're, you're wackadoo and you're not, you're not the median. Think the Tea Party or, right. or think the new left, the, the woman from the Bronx uh, or New York City who was elected. In Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. So, right, in our country, it's the same. So we have strident right <clears throat> part, sub parties and we have strident left sub movements and do you want them in represented as do we want four parties in the legislature or do we want two with the conflict resolution occurring so the bargaining prior to gonna, or after elections? It's going to happen one way or the other, whether it's intra party or party coalition formation between parties. Uh, the question is, what, what, you know, is there is one preferable to the other? Right. And it depends. Well, I on... think there's a interesting uh argument to be made from a libertarian point of view uh, that uh, I haven't taken a look at what the data reveal about this, but I would be skeptical that coalition governments 
are good at moving into liberal directions. Uh, mm. Now, I, I, I could, t but it seems that because you're all in these situations that we've talked about, where the uh, no no party has a majority, so they're put into thrust into coalition negotiations. Uh, it one is putting third and fourth parties sometimes into one might argue a disproportionate amount of power that you know only six or seven percent of people voted for you and now you get to decide uh, well, that's your the, leader could be exactly. the deputy prime minister you'll probably get another ministerial seat you're going to wield a huge amount of influence so in effect and, in israel there's this continual discussion over whether the, the ultra orthodox yeah. have a disproportion or a because they can they hold the margin. They, they hold the margin between yeah. governance and not. Well, they're and called kingmakers. Right. These these parties, right? They just get to. So the U.S. system is designed, um, in effect, on purpose to not allow that to happen. Though arguably, we do have the same thing, but again, we do it intra-party. So the it's the power of single issue or single constituency voting blocks. So well, for then, us, it's it's like the anti-abortion folks within the Republican Party. They're a very powerful block even though they're a, a relative minority of american voters but it depends on whether the the so-called haster rule right the rules of the speaker in the house whether there's a f formal or informal rule within the party that all legislation that the majority party is going to bring to the floor has to have a majority of the majority party which is the so-called haster uh, rule yeah, yeah. named after <laughs> disgraced yeah. speaker yeah. Dennis Hastert. Prior to that, prior to that rule, the U.S. parties did not have that informal mechanism of inclusion because the cleavages within the parties there were Southern Democrats, Northern Democrats, Eastern Republicans, and Western. They they were divided, and so they could never have that rule because they never would. So you had cross party coalitions in the old days, and now. You sort of have seen that disappear. So even within the U.S., the treatment of minority positions within parties has changed over time and how they affect legislation. To, to make a counter argument, so on the point about some odd, you know, what would in another country be an odd minority party um, with, you know, strong preferences for a particular set of positions or for in the, for the sake of a particular community having disproportionate influence. Well, we, we still have that here, even though we do it intra-party. So as folks have noted in 2016, uh, as long as the Republican primaries were competitive, Donald Trump never really won. He averaged less than 40 percent of the Republican vote in Republican primaries until the until basically everyone else had dropped out. He he so he on the back of about 40% of Republican primary voters, uh, then um, won a general election in which, and this is a whole other conversation about how American voters essentially are always going to switch back and forth between voters depending on economic, econo economic conditions and how long one party has been in power versus the other. So it's inevitable. It, it was an election that skewed naturally and he heavily Republican based on the fundamentals. So in other words, the preferences, if you take that 40% of Republican primary voters against the entire voting population, you know, likely vote, uh, voting population of the US, it's a very small percentage. We're talking about something like less than 10% of the American electorate effectively elected Donald Trump by selecting him to be the Republican nominee uh, in an election that was going to naturally skew Republican. So a, a very intensely motivated faction within the Republican Party got their guy in the White House. To me, that's not all that different than in a system where the the Trump representatives in the Republican Party were a third party. There was this new populist, whatever you want to call it, ethno-nationalist party that formed, that held the balance of power between Republicans and Democrats and so had disproportionate influence, right? Like both situations, you can have an intensely motivated small minority have disproportionate political influence. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, I do think that the conversation changes uh, when you're discussing how representatives who will stand are chosen like what's what's sort of interesting is that in the united states with the primary system a lot of these choices are taken out of the hands of the party you know they can to come up with rules yeah, about this yeah. but both major parties send 
out candidates uh, to the field and members of the party or citizens, they, they vote. And so, uh, which is very different to a lot of uh, European parliamentary systems where the leader of the Labour Party is chosen under Labour Party rules. Uh, Labour Party members actually can vote, but uh, the Conservative Party, for instance, uh, you know, it's not conservatives out in uh, mm -hmm. uh, the country. It's a different process. That's uh, true. Yeah. I mean, something that I... And in fact, uh, our the, the primary system you describe in the United States came out of um, the Vietnam War, right? Mm -hmm. The McGovern mm -hmm. Fraser Commission, which so the the riots in '68, right? Because it's people democratic, felt, well, yeah, the, yeah. The, How could you nominate Hubert Humphrey when smoke filled rooms picked this unpopular and, vice president for yeah? And so this is outrageous, and therefore we need primaries. And a whole two generations later, we now we well, don't like parties. It'd be really good to go back to <laughs> sane people in a room picking picking somebody. So, I I'm very um, I'm be behind claims that people are for or against processes. Um, and hearing you today, and I'm not I'm not criticizing. You, I'm just saying behind these notions of process are notions of people have preferences over substantive outcomes and when the, when they don't get what they want they want to change the process they want to change the process yeah. and then lo and behold generations later the process doesn't do what people want it to do and they want to change the process so i'm a i'm a sort of uh, substance reductionist which is behind behind claims of process uh, superiority or inferiority are really Gosh, that person or persons or policies don't deserve the light of day, and I want to make sure they're in the dark forever. Right? I mean, to be honest. And yeah. Uh, well, I remember living in England during a referendum on changing the voting system because there were widespread complaints because the way that the House of Commons, the composition is determined, there are 650 constituencies. And each of these 650 constituencies has one first past the post election. So whoever wins the most votes in that constituency, you go to the House of Commons. Of course, a lot of parties weren't fans of this and would have preferred ranked choice voting because uh, UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, would, I think, get the fourth number, fourth most, fourth most popular party by popular vote, I think, something like that. And yet they only had one MP. Is they had right, because like ten percent, eight percent of the national vote, or something. I, like I would, I don't know the exact figures, but they were certainly after I think Conservative Labour and the Lib Dems, or maybe even beat the Lib Dems. They were easily one of the most popular parties by popular vote, but they only won in one constituency, so they were backing. Uh, but again, is that a legitimate gripe? Well, uh, well, so for, I mean, the U.S. does have a modification in some states beyond the complicated system you described early on in Maine, which is we have runoffs in some states. So so the appeal of majority rather than plurality, there's a there's a lot of sentiment for that. A lot of the mischief you described, right, is is about when there's more than two candidates, then someone can win who has below a majority and all the people who voted for lots of others really don't like that person who won. That right. that's the that's the dreadful scenario you describe. Well a simple, non complicated way to avoid that is to have runoff. Well so you have a it's a collective action problem, right? Where you have you um all these people who voted for all other people, if they were in a room and could talk to each other, they would all oppose the person who had the right. most votes. They that's what each you, other out. Yeah. And it's, so yeah. How do you? What's a simple rather than a complicated way to avoid that? And the answer is a, but run, a runoff. The difference, and they, it, we should probably explain here what we're talking about with ranked choice voting in a second. But the problem with even the runoff is that, so let's say you have a field of five candidates, one of them, you still have the same problem. One of, let's say you have one Democrat and then four Republicans who, because of the local, the local party establishment can, is fraying and they can't select just one, they knock each other out. So only one Republican who may or may not even be the most popular of the four Republicans ends up running against the Democrat and losing because you picked – again, you, they, they won right. the Republican nomination. They, they made it into the top two with like 10, 15 percent of the vote. I'll give you the most absurd example, yeah. which is – today's Washington Post actually talks about Montgomery County, Maryland, where, where I live. Yeah. We had 33 candidates. <laughs> For eleven, Gosh. for eleven positions. Okay. okay, so it's for eleven, but still, it was the nightmare. Yeah. It's what you're described, which yeah. is 
first of all, how you figure out what's going I mean, I tried and basically I couldn't figure out any information about hardly any of them. And um, so your so, I mean, well, your your point's well taken that when there's a lot of candidates, even runoff uh, may not so runoff is preferable. I mean, I think it, it absolves part of that problem of the collective action, people beating each other out, and thus getting someone who most voters are not big fans of ends up winning because of the the people that are generally preferred by the voters knock each other off. Um, but ranked choice voting, maybe we should explain what ranked choice voting is here. And I'll, I'll talk about Maine, I suppose. Um Ranked choice voting is the idea you look at your ballot and instead of being asked a binary question, do you vote for – you cast – well, I guess it's not binary technically, but you cast one vote and that's it. Who who do you want to be to be the representative? The Democratic – Democrat, the Republican, the Libertarian, the Green Party or, you know, or whatever. You cast one vote and that's it. Who is first? Who's going to win? A ranked choice vote says you should select not only who you would most want to see win – but who you would want if the first purse, first place person doesn't win, who the second most palatable option is. So I'm going to vote for the Libertarian, but the Libertarian doesn't win. I would prefer the Green Party, which is probably not going to be a lot of – I'd like to meet that person. <laughs> I'd like to meet that person. They'd be an interesting person. <laughs> I'm going to vote for the Democrat or the Republican as my second choice and then a third choice and the fourth. So you're ranking everyone on your ballot in order of preference. Then what happens with a ranked choice vote is – uh, if no one wins a majority of the vote, so, you know, let's say all the candidates are knocking each other, no one, you know, there's someone with 30%, someone with 25% and so on down, you then start to apportion votes, people's first place votes for lower tier candidates, the person who came in last, I don't know, the, you know, the, the rent is too damn the high, the rent is too damn high party guy. The monster raving weaning party. The one, yes, that's right, the monster, then, the leopards eat people's faces party. Their second goes. choices are then reallocated. Are to... reallocated. So you voted for this really marginal party, they didn't win, you take them off, where does, who is their second place person? They then get that vote and so on and so forth until, until someone gets a majority. That might that that might might be done right away if it's a really narrow election, or it might take a couple of those reapportionments. And so the idea then is that you are more you you help really strongly mitigate this collective action problem and more accurately represent the preference order of the majority of the voters. You create incentives for sincere voting rather than strategic, to use the jargon, and that's. That's a good thing. And, and this happened in Maine, and it's, I think why it's particularly mo notable. Uh, Maine's not the first example of ranked choice voting in the U.S. There have been like a dozen cities like Minneapolis, San Francisco, places like that have done uh, – you know, municipal elections have been decided by ranked choice voting. But it's the first uh, congressional – really first federal election, national level election to have ranked choice voting. And that's because in Maine, there's this long tradition of independents, uh, independent voters going back – I think it was nine of their previous 11 governors have won without majorities of the voters. And like we're talking uh, uh, Paul LePage, who's very unpopular oh, man, in Maine. Um, <laughs> uh, he won in 2010 with 38 percent of the vote. So we're not talking about like 48 versus 49 kind of, you know, 38 percent. He won in that, you know, the state list, the you know, top state level position. Um, and again, this is this there's a long history of this. And people got fed up. They were tired. When you only win with 38% of the vote, and arguably Maine is – and he's a Republican. Arguably Maine is – Maine voters tend to skew a little bit towards the Democratic voter on the net. So to be clear, he – he won 38% of the vote in a first-past-the-post governor's first election, right? First-past-the-post, right. Okay. Yeah, right. right. And uh, because basically the main Democratic Party would squabble and then independent candidates who tended to be right, right. probably more into the Democratic Party would enter – anyways and split that split if you will the democratic left vote and so the republican wins despite not mm -hmm. being particularly popular um and that's become normal so maine decide hey we're going to pass we're going to try this thing called ranked choice voting uh and for the first time it actually kicked in in an election just this last november a republican incumbent running for uh re-election in maine's second congressional district uh, uh, Bruce Pollenquin Paul won the first round with 46.2% to Democrat Jarrett Golden's 45.5%. So 
pretty close, 0.7% difference. No majority, so then you did, they did the apportionment thing, and the fourth place person got apportioned, then the third place person, uh, and in the end, uh, the Democrat Jerry Golden gets an upset victory. Uh, and re reverses the result. It's all kind of in court right now. Uh, essentially, the court case comes down to I lost and don't like losing, so I'm going to try to sue to prevent the the election. It, it's almost certainly going to go the way the ranked choice voting thing. Or those uh, ballots that came in by canoe were they legal from the <laughs> from the North Woods? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the beaver fur trappers in <laughs> far northern Maine. Um, Guess what, though? Today's Washington Post, I mean, it just, I happened yeah. to read it before I came in. So this this system is being proposed in Montgomery County because of the 33, of the 33 candidate yeah. for 11 seat problem. Guess what? Um, the various ad, uh, advocacy groups representing minority voters said it would be unfair because, to be delicate, they said those with low information and, and uh, would go into such a voting system and find it extraordinarily confusing and we'd be discouraged and would not vote. So uh, yeah. I had not anticipated that um, kind of uh, concern, but uh, there it was in today's post that uh, voting systems have to be simple for the less involved and less educated yeah. voter. It... But I, I, I've, it's the first time I've seen that it strikes me as a uh again haven't looked at the relevant data but uh the diversity of voting systems in functioning democracies seems to be a strong counterpoint to that uh now maybe uh germans and new zealanders and every like walk into polling places and really don't know what they're doing <laughs> just randomly filling in boxes but it strikes me as not the case and I, well even I, think of maine i mean the state that enacted mm -hmm. the system of voting uh, i think would rank rather low on income and education relative to the country as a whole and yet they adopted it so uh, yeah uh well, and we were going to spend a, a chunk of the show talking about like alternative systems. There's a thing called the DeHunt method that Feeney was going to talk about. And there's other mixed proportional systems like in New Zealand. There's democracy vouchers, which are really about campaign finance, but you could apply as well to voting itself being tried in Seattle. But for sake of time, we won't go into that. But to your point, Matthew, there's <clears throat> there are dozens of. The DeHunt method is just one. I mean, like there are dozens of different ways of apportioning votes to try to more closely represent the will of the people being tried all over the world with relative success. I mean, no one says that's not a legitimate democracy because they counted the votes this way versus that way. I mean, right, right. Uh, I, I would, and people uh, understand it just fine. And yeah, yeah, we should. Uh, well, th we'll put. Uh, explain a websites and videos in the show notes for this yeah. so that anyone interested in how these different methods work can go and check out for themselves. Uh, I, I want to stress that while we've been talking about ways in which to choose legislative bodies, there are, uh, there are legislative bodies that use these voting systems among themselves to apportion ministerial seats, for example. So uh, the Northern Irish Assembly being one example. So don't think of this as just a method for citizens voting for legislatures, but also how some legislatures determine certain uh, seats and memberships. Well, and we did this in the US as well. Uh, uh, Jefferson, the DeHunt method is actually kind of based off of something Thomas Jefferson did when it came to apportioning Congress. So we're talking about apportioning votes to candidates, but Jefferson had this method, how do we decide which states get how many representatives mm -hmm. and use something very similar to this DeHunt thing we're talking about. So it's not just about apportioning votes it's also apportioning seats or positions right all this stuff is is you know um it's kind of touches on all of those things even if we don't have time to go into them in more detail so maybe here to, to for the last bit we should talk about what what are the consequences what would we expect the consequences to be of ranked choice voting um or other you know alternative voting apportionment uh, for how we do elections, like what what are the expected outcomes, good or bad? So I would take a guess that if this was widely adopted for congressional elections, uh, which so for House and Senate, I think in the near future you would see actually relatively little change because I think there would be some growing pains potentially. But people and also 
people, it takes a while for tribalism to wear off and people might not have liked Republicans that much, but they'll continue voting that way. But in the long term, uh, it provides incentives for what Peter describes as sincere voting. So we should expect in the long term, if this was widely adopted, more Greens, Libertarians to end up in these chambers. Uh, but I don't think it would be, um, I don't think it would actually reflect a uh, polling of the support for these parties actually um, that quickly. So that's a guess. One thing we haven't talked about at all are electoral system entry barriers. In other words, how do you get on the ballot in a state? Yeah, yeah. So we have not talked at all about how it varies. I mean, how many signatures do you have to gather? Some states, you have to have so much of the vote in the last election to be on the ballot in this election. Or to the be ability. allowed to debate. Or yeah. So yeah. Yeah. all of that. So in addition to the aggregating systems we've discussed, there are all these uh, behind the scenes electoral get on the ballot rules that vary tremendously by state, which tend to be barriers to entry to minority uh, viewpoints of all sorts. And, and uh, New York State's an exception. They have Democrat, Republican, and ongoing liberal and conservative parties for almost all seats on the ballot, which is unusual. Most other states really make it quite difficult to be a minority party and get on the ballot. I do think on the net, um, and you're you're absolutely right. Like, and and what's notable is that these rules for who gets on the ballot are the state legislature, which is usually is always controlled by one of the two major parties, erects barriers to entry for challengers that undermine the two party yeah. establishment. So, unsurprisingly, they rig the system. But in a ranked choice voting system, we should expect. Uh, third parties to be more relevant. That doesn't mean it probably won't win too many more elections. I suppose it increases the odds on the margin some. So instead of you would in, under one, the system, yeah. you would be willing as you Matthew, you'd be willing to vote sincerely, not worrying that your vote would be thrown away or would cause chaos, um, which it does sometimes so, under the current system. So you take main second congressional district still early on, I think your point Feeney about this over time, be, you know, the, the effects be becoming larger. But even at this first test case in Maine, you have uh, something like a combined eight or nine percent of, of voters in the second congressional district went for the third and fourth candidate combined, which is higher. I mean, most elections, third parties, it's it's usually like two percent libertarian, one percent libertarian, half a percent green. Correct. It's, yeah. So we may be tripled or quadrupled the number of voters in one congressional district willing to vote for someone other than the two major parties. And that's significant then too, because I think it leads into our next bit. So even if it doesn't mean, you might have a few more third party, libertarian, green, socialist, whatever, getting seats, a few more, um, you get a lot more uh, attention paid to the issues they care about. I mean, the, the not nice way of talking about this is horse trading, but like what you can imagine, this already happened actually in Maine. The third and fourth candidates in that election both basically said, we want our supporters, if we don't win, we want our supporters to put number two, this golden guy, the non-incumbent, right? They already – and Golden went out of his way to court them saying like, obviously, I want you to vote for me first. But hey, I'm attentive to your concerns. I promise to do this with my platform. Whereas the incumbent was like, no, this is a terrible, I don't like this system, didn't court them. So again, if you want a more empowered multi-party system with libertarians or whoever, radicals of any stripe having more influence, this seems like a pretty good way of doing it. Major party candidates have to be more directly attentive to what you want. Well, earlier you said a in your intro, you said a I forget the data. You you said public opinion polls show people are very dissatisfied with their choices. Yeah. Well, this would, I think, at least at some level, solve the problem. You see. In other words, you you get to express yourself. Voting has expressive purposes, and yet, given you know that you are uh, that you don't have many fellow travelers, you then vote second and third the way that um, you also believe, but it won't. Your your initial choice won't cause chaos, and so that that would solve 
maybe we haven't used the word. I'm surprised. Um, legitimacy, mm, right? Mm, that's that a good word. no, yeah. I, I yeah, mean, yeah, uh, no, that's that's an important question. Getting people to buy into this preference aggregation yeah. system is important. Well, that's why you had a lot of people. Uh, in the wake of the last presidential election, you know, the, the hashtag president. not my president. Yeah, because, yeah, this, yeah. because I think it strikes that some people uh, just find it intuitively grossly unfair that someone who didn't actually win the popular vote is somehow a winner, right? And we don't have time to get into the, the constitutional arguments and the history behind the Electoral College and everything, but uh, that that's a crucial issue in all of this. But it would feel a lot more legitimate if in that election or say in 2000, if they then apportioned those third party spoilers based on their second choice votes. And so they could say, rather than Bush isn't my president because he didn't win the popular vote, you say Bush was my president because once we took into account the second choice preferences, <laughs> they actually second. did have, <laughs> a, right? Like mm -hmm. that, it helps so, in legitimacy. And it matters because when, when it comes down to it, democracy is just a bunch of paper or ink on paper and people agreeing that that has a th that the authorities have authority, that they have a legitimate claim to power in a society. I mean, legitimacy, ma legitimacy matters because it's how a, a governing system functions. Right? Let me throw out something from the literature. Um, th most of our listeners have probably heard of Rawl, John Rawls and the his theory of justice and the Rawlsian veil of ignorance, which is a, a thought device in political philosophy to imagine you didn't know anything about where you were in the income distribution or anything and what kind of set of rules would you choose for collective choice uh, once we re actually started society. The problem that arises in such a calculation is how wacko do you think you and your descendants will be, i.e., are you a permanent minority? So in, notice, even though you alluded to the Electoral College, notice if we change to, uh, in effect, a majoritarian non-electoral college system, uh, everyone in flyover country might conceive of themselves as a, being in a permanent minority. That is, they're, they're never, ever, conceivably ever going to be in the majority ever again, and... Dot, 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 dot. So under the so then we tend to think of uh, anyway f trying to figure out what how to deal with permanent minorities or people with chronically minority outcomes under majority rule or any kind of system um, does that factor into legitimacy? Well, um, we do want to avoid. I mean, Madison, James Madison, was very attentive to the balance between. Uh, he didn't want tyranny of the majority. So, like, I mean, democracy was something of a dirty word um, at the time, a pure, the idea of a pure democracy. So you don't want a system where 51% or, in our case, a plurality, they just get to dictate terms to the permanent minorities who have essentially no voice because they can't get a majority, you know, coalition together. Um, he was also attentive to the problems of faction. So he didn't want... Uh, a major a system where majority has all the power, but he also didn't want lots and lots of warring factions that can't effectively govern. So he wanted to strike a middle road, but and whether or not he did that successfully or not is an open question. But um, it's to your point, like you have to be concerned about about uh, both of these concerns. I mean, I think the idea of ranked choice voting so is that yes, for example, urban people now feel the electoral college doesn't serve their interests, and I guess. In some sense, they're correct. Yeah, but the electoral college serves the interests of states that are empty or emptying out. Yeah, and it if does. It does yeah, it. Uh, I mean, I do think the people who uh, object to the electoral college should actually carry Peter's thought experiment further uh, when they finish listening, which is well. If it was really the case that uh, to become president, you just needed uh, a plurality of the popular vote to win. Then they just they would all be flying to Texas and California, Florida, New York, and uh, if you want the alienation problem in this country to get worse, uh, why yeah. would anyone fly to Iowa. Michigan or Iowa or yeah, any yeah. of these places? Uh, that that would make like, American politics, I think, much more divisive. Which isn't an argument yeah. one way or the other about the electoral college. It's just uh, something to observe. So the electoral college is a technology, is a is a is a structure meant to try to strike that balance, right? Meant or a to, union of states, not a... Right, and it's meant to give folks who would otherwise 
be a minority or be a permanent minority a voice despite the fact that they mm -hmm. they aren't as big of a state as virginia or new york right so it was designed as a, a tech to to try to help solve that or strike that balance ranked choice voting is again another tech meant to try to mitigate that balance and it does so so let's say we remove the let's say you remove the electoral college we get rid of the plurality system and so oh no i live in iowa which used to be important because i got all these disproportionate electoral significance um, i get two senators from north dakota even though it's, it has the population of poughkeepsie or something right like okay so you remove all that so now you know you're in you're in this permanent minority when it comes to national influence, except again, ranked choice voting means that even though you are small, you're a permanent minority, as long as you're passionate, as long as you have very discrete, concentrated interests, you can punch above your weight. So yes, Iowa and the ranked choice vote system would have less influence because of the electoral college, but arguably more influence because, well, you know, the Iowa corn lobby or hog lobby if, if that's propelling their votes, they could say, hey, we'll trade off. We know we're not going to win as, as much significance, but we'll trade off our votes in exchange for a promise. You, you, you see, again, that negotiation can still happen, giving permanent minorities a voice in helping solve the alienation problem. So that, that would be my, my, I think, my answer, mm -hmm. answer, the answer there. Um, just for time's sake, I a few more things. Uh, one of our uh, colleagues noted that there is a connection. This isn't with ranked choice voting per se, but it has to do with proportional representation that countries with more proportional representation where, you know, essentially uh, they apportion seats in the na in the national legislature based on uh, the percentage of the, of the popular vote. So multi-party systems tend to have larger welfare states, have more more government. And uh, the colleague made the argument that because of that, you should be suspicious about system about moving in a more multi-party friendly direction. Um, and uh, so, what, what do you guys think? As libertarians, should we be suspicious of ranked choice voting pushing us in multi-party direction because it means a bigger welfare state, a more intrusive government? Is there a reason you're concealing the name of this colleague so I don't have to <laughs> no. go to their office and? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I make sure. That it? Okay, it's well, irrelevant. It's yeah, irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> I. I, I don't have enough information to make See, it. we need to, I mean. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what we need is, again, remember I said process, cons mm -hmm. process versus substance. So we need to know someone, someone who makes this claim that has to somehow study the, if we could figure it out, the true preferences of the population for redistribution, and then somehow then make the argument that if those preferences were aggregated in a uh, a republic style first past the post system without and, and a non parliamentary system, outcomes would somehow be different, mm -hmm. right? That in other words, take take the underlying preferences of Italy or France or whatever, crank them through a U.S. system, and they would have a smaller welfare state. Mm -hmm. Might be. I mean, I don't know. I've never it. I tend to be suspicious of that kind of argument, and then say, um, "There's a there's a whole literature that says that." Um, well, two things: one, states that trade a lot in Europe, right? They have smaller countries, and so they trade a lot. And so, one price for free trade is sort of a safety net, and it, the voters understand that, and they so they have freer markets in return for. Um, a, a, a net through which they cannot fall because trade come, sometimes makes you re redundant uh, to be. Um, and uh, shoot, what was the second? Uh, so, I mean, what I hear from what you're saying, Peter, is this idea that, yes, there's a correlation there, but maybe this isn't we're, – we're, we're, we're reading a cause, cause, causal element into this correlation that there – it just so happens that because of the literal size and oh. shape and structure of these regions and that that we're getting yes. this outcome. And that doesn't have to do with the proportion system, the, vote, the voting or even representation system per se. It just has to do with the happenstance of, of the region. And second, the, I remember what the second thing I was going to say. Even though the size of government in European countries is larger than ours, um, their tax systems are less progressive. So ironically, the, there's a lot more benefits for workers 
in those in those countries, but the workers pay for them through consumption taxes, the VAT. Notice the French are rioting in part because Macron wants to raise the price that they face to pay for their stuff. And it's large. I mean, the price of what they consume yeah. is large. And it, so the, the U.S. has a progressive tax system, ironically, and Europe, European countries, capital doesn't pay for stuff in Europe. Workers do. Yeah. Uh, so be careful. So um, questions it, of correlation and causation get messy. Really so in other words, quickly. libertarians yeah, yeah. might say the welfare state's larger in Europe, but it's not a tax on capital. So in some sense, that might be... Um, Whereas in the United States, it, the price, the tax on capital actually may be greater. I also think, I mean, this goes back to something we were discussing before, which is that speaking to the alienation problem, a system, I mean, so if the complaint is if we more closely represent the median will of the voters, the voters want bigger government. And since we don't want bigger government, we should not more closely represent the will of the people. So this is this is uh, you know ruled by technocratic elite. I versus, worry about. I'm a that's I'm a Democrat with a small D. It's not um, real sustainable. I mean, for example, alienation, yeah. How many th three states in the United States? I think in the last election had referenda on whether to expand Medicaid or not in Republican states, and they all approved. Mm. So now, to be sure, it's not clear they explicitly understood that. The feds promised to pay for this expansion, but eventually they're going to probably renege, and then maybe the gov your your own state's going to have to pay. You know, it, it's a complicated choice. But um, I'm wary of deciding we know what. So I agree with you. The common, the hoi, hoi polloi, they don't know what their interests are, so we're going to do what's best for them. Right, and that's that can get get you in trouble over over the over the medium term for sure although brexit does give one pause <laughs> that's, <laughs> so, right. that's right <laughs> no matter what system you have people are going to do dumb things with it I there we go is, that, is that may be the... <laughs> this story well thanks guys for coming in uh for this i think stimulating and complicated discussion about uh, ranked choice voting and voting alternatives uh and for you listener until next week be well Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.